Psalms chapter number 3 and verse 16. And I do invite you to come and join us for our installation service. Now that's not just stuff. We're going to have church that night. We're going to have a great move of God. We're going to have great preaching. Uh, we'll, we'll, toward the end of the service, we'll do the official installation. I've never been installed in my life, so I don't even know what all that stuff means. So it doesn't really mean much to me, but they said we were supposed to have one. And so we're going to have one. But don't don't stay at home thinking it's just something for the district. It's for us. Right. And there'll be a few guests here, but it's, we're just going to kick Friends Day off early on Come that on. Friday night. And I think God's going to meet us in a great, great way. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 16. We went over this last week for where envying and strife is. There is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without, here's that word again, partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Everybody say mature, mature. Christianity. God bless you. you. May be seated. This is where we left off last week, but I felt compelled to come back and highlight this one verse again <coughs> because of the importance that I think it teaches both in their day and in our day, and because of the truth that I believe it contains. John three sixteen. I'm sorry, James three sixteen. <laughs> quote John 3.16. Maybe we need to add James 3.16 to the list. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now, the word confusion there comes from a Greek word meaning instability or a state of disorder. Dissension disturbance. Where envy and strife is, there is instability. Right. There's disturbance. Yes. There's disorder. Yes. The word confusion is used in four of the verses in the New Testament. I will just highlight one of them. Luke chapter 21 and verse 9. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions. And that word commotion is the same word that James used as confusion. So I think it's interesting that God connects the confusion in the church that takes place when people are lobbying or politicking for positions and promoting themselves. He relates the same word that Jesus used to say the kind of confusion and commotion that will be in place at the end time. So when there's confusion in the church because there's self-promotion in the church and because there's people lobbying for certain positions in the church, James is saying it's going to be the same thing that's in the world at the coming of the Lord. This is why I believe Jesus was concerned when His disciples started trying to figure out who was His favorites. Come on. Come on. Mark chapter number 10, and, and we'll go to verse number 35 and just have a Bible study. If that's okay, if that's okay, say amen. Amen. If it's not okay, that's <laughs> Fine too. Amen. Buckle up. Enjoy the ride. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now, now you know it's going to be a bad conversation with Jesus when you come to Jesus and say, Oh, by the way, we want you to do for us whatever we desire. We're not worried about serving you. Come on. You give us what we want. And he played along. And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? And 
Anytime Jesus asks questions, he knows answers. <laughs> and they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You don't even know what you're asking. You, you can't. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, you, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I shall be baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, that's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. So I want you to get the picture. All twelve of them are around. And where envy and strife is, there is confusion. Come on. Amen. There's every evil work. And so here's the twelve holiest people that Jesus could grab. His church. And they are trying to lobby on who's going to be where and who's going to be over what. And the other ten heard it, and they became very displeased. And so now there's rumblings in the small church. Right. But Jesus called them to Him and said unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. He's saying, You're acting like the world. That's what He was saying. You're acting like the heathen people. Listen, when we get in the church and we start self-promoting and we start trying to worry about us more than we do the kingdom of God, we're, we're, we're no better than the world. Amen. We're acting just like the world. Verse 43, Jesus said, But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you, they're going to be your minister. Right. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, you're going to be the servant of all. So if you want to sit on the right, if you want to sit on the left, and if you want to be part of the glory, you've got to get to the lowest common denominator. Right. Amen. If you think it's about being up here, Jesus said you can't handle it up here. You better get down here. Right. But nobody wants to be down here. Right. Come on. And anytime there are people who are jockeying for positions, then that is an open door for people to entertain stuff and be possessed with stuff that they should have never had to deal with. Because where envy and strife is, there is every evil work. And that's why you have a verse like Luke 22 and verse 3. Then enter Satan into Judas. This is why it is of the utmost importance that we keep our spirit right. Because when we start entertaining envy and strife, then we are propping open the door for everything else to enter in. Confusion and every evil work. Now this is what the Bible says. Amen. But when there's confusion in the church and when there's evil work in the church, you don't have to go look for devils. You don't have to go look for demons. You don't have to go look for sinners. you got to look for somebody that's trying to have, that's, that's struggling with envy and strife. Right. Yes. right. Amen. And somebody said amen. 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 So we, we, why don't we just get to the place to where we let God decide yes. who sits on the right and who sits right. on the left amen. and who's over this and who's over that and yes. who's got this. And why don't the rest of us just be content with just loving Jesus yes. and witnessing to people, inviting people to church. And when God says it's time to come up, Promotion doesn't come from the east and the west or the south. That's what the Bible says. Promotion comes from the north. Promotion comes from God. There's not a devil that can stop you when you enter into your season. There's not a problem that can derail you when God says, now it's your time. I'm going to prophesy to somebody on a midweek Bible study. God's getting ready to let you enter in to your season. You've been on the side. do it. It's in so let's jump over to James chapter 4 and just deal with this a little more. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Everybody say, we love Pastor James. We love Pastor, James. Pastor James is dealing with some stuff in the church. 
He said, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lust that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you... You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Now surely we should live together in love and harmony. Yet often we do not. And this is never the will of God for James chapter 4 to be unfolding in the church, for there to be wars and fighting and quarrels. It's just, right. Amen. It's just not God's will. You look throughout all the Bible, you see Lot caused a quarrel with his uncle Abraham. Absalom created a war for his father David. Even the disciples, like I just talked about, created problems for the Lord when they argued over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. When we study some of the early churches, we discover that they had their fair share of disagreements. Right. The members of the Corinthian church were competing with each other in the public meetings about who could speak in tongues more than anybody else. <laughs> They were taking their own brothers and sisters in the church to sue each other in the court. The Galatian believers were biting and devouring one another. By the way, I've started trying to memorize Galatians. And all I can say is, God bless our Bible. Yes. <laughs> Paul had to admonish the Ephesians to, to have spiritual unity. And the church at Philippi had problems. There, there was two women who could not get along with each other. Imagine that. Yeah. And James begins to mention several different kinds of disagreements among the saints. There are going to be disagreements among the saints. Right. But we cannot let those disagreements turn into bitter war. Right. Amen. That's right. That's right. Hatfields versus McCoys. That's silly. Right, amen. Maturity. Maturity. First of all, James begins to talk about what we might could classify as uh, class wars. The age-long rival rivalry between the rich and the poor. The rich man gets the attention, the more poor man is ignored. The rich man is sitting in the nice seat in the church. The poor man is sitting on the floor somewhere in the back. That's what he's dealing with. How sad and tragic when local churches, when our churches get, the, get their values confused and we cater to the rich while we ignore and reject the poor. Right. Amen. He then began to talk about what we would call employment warfare. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Again, it's the rich man who's got the power to control and hurt the poor man. So he talks about laborers do not get their wages or do they, they do not get fair wages. And, and apparently the believers that James wrote to were at war with each other over positions in the church. They were wanting to be teachers and leaders. They were promoting themselves at the harm of others. He then discussed personal wars. And what I mean by that is that all the saints were speaking evil of one another. Wow. Hey, when I read stuff like this, I look around at our church and go, man, this is a great church. Yes, this is a good church. Amen. Now, James was not forbidding us to use discrimination or even evaluate people because you have to know them that labor among you. And Christians need to have discernment. But we cannot act like we're God. Right. Amen. And start passing judgment off. Of exactly. Amen. And, and if we're really Christ-like, then the first thing we'll do is before we examine anybody else, we'll examine That's ourselves. Right. Come on, we now, I've done this many times throughout our little study here on the book of James. I'll continue tonight. I hope it's okay. But I'm just going to reread it to you now out of the New Living Translation. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have. But you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Right. You don't have to kill nobody, just talk to God. Amen. 
And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Now, although there are only three verses right there in James chapter 4, there is a multitude of truths and knowledge that we could and should be, that could be gained from that passage of Scripture. Amen. Now, the first thing that James addresses is the subject of greed. Everybody say greed. Greed. Oh, God, deliver us from greedy people. Right. God loves a cheer, cheerful giver. Right. I don't think greedy people are high on God's invitation list. Webster defines the word greed as excessive or insatiable desire. <coughs> Now that definition in and of itself is not bad, but what James is dealing with is not an excessive or insatiable desire for God, but an excessive or insatiable desire for worldly, fleshly, and carnal things. Now understand me tonight, there is nothing wrong with wanting to better yourself. I want Caitlin to have it better than I had it. That's right. I would hope my parents wanted me to have it better than they have it. Your parents want you to have it better than they have it. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to better yourself or to live in a nicer home or drive a nicer car or make more money. Nothing wrong with all that. But when that desire overtakes your entire life, right. Amen. and that becomes your God with the little G, That's right. and then you kind of replace your God with the big G with all that other stuff, you're in for much trouble. Amen. And James is teaching that if your greed reaches such a carnal level that it won't be long till you're killing people to get what you don't have. That's right. Now if the blanket could be pulled back over the history of the world, there's absolutely no telling how many people have been killed simply because they wanted what somebody else had. Wars have been started because we wanted and they wanted what somebody else had. Right. Amen. <clears throat> There's a little book out there called The Day America Told the Truth. I don't know when that day was. Uh, but there's a book out there and it has some interesting statistics in it. Here was the question that was posed. What are you willing to do for $10 million? What are you willing to do for $10 million? Two-thirds of Americans polled would agree to at least one and some to several of the following. Would put their children up for adoption. Three percent said they would do that for $10 million. Number two, would kill a stranger. Seven percent said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. Stranger danger. 10% said they would withhold testimony to let a murderer go free for $10, $10 million. 16% said they would leave their spouse. There are so many jokes right there. So I'm not going there. I'm a, I'm a mature Christian. 16% of the people polled said they would give up their American citizenship for $10 million. 23% said they would become prostitutes for one week. $10 million. Talk about greed. Doing anything to get something you don't have and maybe you were supposed to never have. That's right. 25% said they would abandon their entire family for $10 million. 25% said they would leave their church for $10 million. I was like, man, I know people who's left for a lot of this. You're writing specials, right? I want you to understand what I just read to you. These little eight statistics are, are the epitome of greed. And if two-thirds of America is willing to do at least one of them, and many of them, several, all for $10 million, which will soon vanish. That's Don't right. you dare look at me funny when I come to church several times a week. Amen. Right. Don't you dare look at me funny when I say I will, I will live for God with all my heart. If people are selling out for dollar signs, 
give me somebody that says, God, I'll live for you no matter what comes or what goes. See, I'm going to come at it from a different angle tonight. What makes greed so bad is not the, the drive, it's the object of the greed. Right, right. Come on. And what makes lust so bad is the object that you're lusting after. So if we flip the tables and if we would become a church that would become greedy for God right. Amen. and that would have a strong lust or a strong desire for a greater relationship with God right. then according to this principle there's nothing that would stop us from getting what God says that we could have. Right. If we would get hungry for it, we could possess it. If we would get greedy for it, if you're to wars and, and killing and doing whatever you got to do to get stuff you weren't supposed to ever have. Spiritually speaking, if we could get so greedy that we want 700 and then we want 800 and then we want 1,000 and then we want a church over there and we want a church on the east side and we want a church up there. There's too much satisfaction in the church when God said the world exploding because of their greed. Right. I asked the Lord once, I said, Lord, how can I get greed out of the church? And I felt like the Lord spoke back to me and said, you don't want greed out of the church. You simply want people to be greedy for me. Right. You want the object that their greed is after. You want that out of the church. But you want that same thing. And I felt like God went on to say that if we would become greedy for Him, an insatiable, excessive desire, yes. then He would show up. Right. And there'd be a line of people up here testifying. There would be a line of people ever service saying, last week God did this. And last yesterday God did this. And there'll be more waiters leaving their jobs, coming to church, getting baptized on a Sunday night and getting filled with the Holy Ghost. If we could just get hungry... He said that if you are greedy enough, you'll get to the point where you will kill in order to fulfill that greed. And again, I'm coming at it from a different angle. I get that. But when we get greedy enough for God and for His Spirit and for true apostolic Pentecostal Holy Ghost revival, then we would be willing to kill our flesh. Amen. Amen. Kill our desires. Yes. Kill our wants. Yes. And be able to pray that prayer. He must increase and I must decrease. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, get greedy. Get greedy. And then James begins to deal with the subject of provision. He gives us two reasons why people don't have what they need. Verse number two, he said, You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Or if you are asking, you're asking amiss. So according to this passage, there's two reasons why we don't have. One, simply because we don't ask. Or two, we ask with the wrong motives. Right. Now, I'm going to be bold tonight. Come on. But I'm going to submit to you that if you don't have, it's because you're not asking or it's because you're asking with the wrong motive. Right. Amen. Amen. God's not bankrupt. God's not out of fill in the blank. Either we're not asking and a lot of stuff that we're doing is murmuring and complaining but it's not asking. Right. So either we're not asking or we're asking amiss. If you need a blessing, don't ask me. Ask God. Right. If you need a healing, don't ask me. Ask God. If you need a miracle, I don't have nothing bottled up here. But you can ask God. We've got too many people, especially in Pentecost, we've got too many people who are chasing preachers. Right. If so and so's in town, then I can be healed. If, if Brother Apostle is here, then I can be set free and I can get a blessing and I can do this. And I know there are some men who generate more faith than others, and that's fine. I get that. But we need to understand that it is not by might and it is not by power, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. And if we would start putting our faith in God, 
as much as we do in certain men or women of God, God can come down. Because we don't need brother so-and-so here this weekend. We've got God here this weekend. Amen. We can fly somebody in. We've got the Holy Ghost that's here. We just got to have the faith to talk to God and ask Him. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Now you can come tonight. You can ask me for something. But I'm limited. So you ask me for X amount of dollars. You ask me if, what for a vehicle, whatever. I'm limited. I, I can give you what I got, but I'm limited. Men are limited. The church is limited. You are limited. But God is limitless. Amen. Why ask a limited man? When you can lay your petitions Amen. at the throne room of a limitless God. Amen. I want you to walk out of this church tonight asking God to do what you need Him to do. Ask Him with a pure heart and a right mode of God. I know you're able. I know you can do it. You can get me a job. You know I need a job. My family needs a job. My kids need me to get a job. You can help me, God. You can deliver me. I didn't want it to happen like this. says it like this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, after this matter, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. So we're not asking down here, we're asking up there. Right. Jesus said, direct your prayers toward me. Direct your prayers toward the Lord, not, not, not the earth. I want you to leave this church tonight with more faith in God than you have in man. Right. More faith in the true shepherd than you do the under shepherd. You have not because you ask not. The other reason we don't have is because we ask with the wrong motives. We're trying to trick God. We're playing God like a lottery. We're, we're saying things like, God, please give me a million dollars. God, if you give me a million dollars, you know good and well that God, I'll give, I'll, I'll pay my tithes to the church. And the Lord's saying, you don't pay your tithes on ten dollars. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I mean, so if, if, if somebody gives you $10 and you can't give the Lord a dollar, don't you dare lie to me, yourself, and to God and say, if you give me a million, I'll give the church a hundred thousand. Come on. Come on. Amen. So we're asking amiss. Right. We're asking with wrong motives. Right. You know, it's, it's what I call roller coaster praying. God, get me off this roller coaster. Yeah. I don't know why I let my wife talk me into getting on this roller coaster. If you'll get me off this roller coaster alive, I'll never ride this roller coaster again. <laughs> Knowing good and well that I'm probably going to get right back in line when I realize I can do it. And many times we pray stuff like that. We pray, and God knows our, He hears our voice, but He knows our hearts. Right, right. Amen. Yeah. And he could not answer that prayer because it would ruin us. If you haven't been found faithful in the small things, God can't trust you with, with large things. Does that make sense? Yes. So Lord, why am I not getting? Well, are you asking? And are you asking with the right motive? 
Let me, let me show you a picture. You remember when Solomon was praying one night? And so this, this is the idea of praying with the right motive. Solomon's praying one night. The Lord shows up. God shows up at prayer meetings. And God says, uh, okay, what, what do you want? I'm ready. What do you want? So, I mean, you've you got God here. You've got an attention, an audience with the Lord. You've got God's attention. And, and this is what Solomon said. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord. Okay. I want my prayers to please the Lord. Right. Amen. Amen. That Solomon had asked this Thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked for riches for thyself. No, no, how do we pray? God, I don't want to die. Come on. Add years to my life, God. I don't want to be in debt. Give me some money, God. God, I'm sick of my enemies killing. That's how we pray. Take them out. Right, now. Like that old country song says, I went to church, heard the preacher say you need to pray for your enemies. and So he said, I went home and started praying for my enemies. I prayed the brakes go out, going down a hill. I, I prayed this bad thing. I, prayed, I don't think that's what God was talking about. He said, because you didn't ask for long life and because you didn't ask for riches for yourself, because you didn't ask me to take away your enemies and make your road smoother, but because you asked for understanding to discern judgment, behold, I've given you what you've asked for. I've given you a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. See, when you come to God with a clean heart, and when you come to God with the right spirit, and when you start really asking for what you need to ask, He'll look down and go, not only am I going to give you what you asked for, but because you didn't ask for that, because you didn't want to make it easier for you, now I'm going to give you more. You know what? I just feel like telling somebody, God's about to start answering our prayers around here. But He's going to also start giving us stuff that we didn't pray for. Because we pray with a pure heart here and a right motive there. He says, I'm going to give you that, but I'm also going to give you this. And I'm going to give you that because your heart is right. You have not. Right. Yeah. No wonder the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Amen. It's it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, whatever, whatever else you need. God said, I'll add that to you. I'll That's give right. that to you. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. Then he just kind of keeps hitting them. You adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. The NIV says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Right. Now James is not beating around the bush here. He hits a nail right on the head and says, hey, you're committing adultery. If you try to be a friend to God and a friend to the world. Right. Amen. You are an adulterer and an adulteress. Now the first word I want you to bring out of this real quick is friendship of the world. And then I want to focus on the enemy of God. Friendship, the word friendship comes from a Greek word philia, which is where we would get Philadelphia. It, it means love. The, Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. So this friendship means more than just uh, dwelling together or shaking one another's hand. It's much deeper than that. So I'm not saying you can't have friends in the world. You have to have friends in the world. That's right. Remember, we gotta we got to make sinners friends yes. and friends disciples and disciples into disciple makers. That's right. We have to do that. But what I'm talking about is loving the system. Right. Amen. 
is that you all of a sudden you love the things of the world more than you love the things of God. Right. Amen. And no man can love the things of this world and say that he loves God. You can't have strong feelings for or a relationship with the evil, unholy things of this world and still have a strong feeling with a good, with the good and holy things in the kingdom of God. Right. Amen. I knew a family one time. I'm going to couch my language here because we're on the internet. But I knew a family one time, whether in the spirit or not, uh, that lived somewhere north, south, east, or west. And they were married. A husband and wife was married. But something happened in their marriage. And uh, so he picked up a girlfriend. Now, just FYI, we still frown upon that. That's right. Amen. That's right. The Bible still kind That's of frowns right. upon right. that. Right. Amen. But this family just accepted it. <clears throat> so the girlfriend would be at the family events. And uh, the girlfriend would come to the house and eat supper. And the girlfriend and the girlfriend and the girlfriend. That, that's kind of the picture. As dysfunctional as that sounds to us, God says, that's exactly what I think about it. When you come into church, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And then as soon as you walk out, you just all of a sudden become a friend of the world. Come on. You love the things in the world. You love the sparkle of the world. You, you love the dress of the world. You love everything. But now you're going to be back here on Sunday. You bring in your girlfriend into something that you've got a marriage with. Right. And that's dysfunction. Woo. And so here's what James is saying. You can't do that. You, you are an adulterer and adulteress if you're doing that. You, you, let, let me tell you something. There is a push... There is a push in our in our society right now for churches to accept homosexual marriages. If we do that, then what we're doing is befriending the world. That's right. Amen. Amen. There's a call in our country and, and in most of our churches to drop any type of standard and just blend in with all the other religions and beliefs so there's no division and there's no confusion. And if we do that, we're, we're befriending the world. Right. But we're becoming an enemy to God. Right. Oh sure, you're going to make the world happy if you just kind of start marrying homosexuals and you'll probably even make the news and you'll get up some, some publicity. But you become an enemy of God. Now I would rather for the world to hate me and God to love me than for the world to love me and God to love me. You better thank God you're in a true preaching church. You better thank God that you're in a church that stands upon the holy word of God. Let God be true. contrary to their lifestyle. Right. Amen to that. No, I don't, I'm not talking about beating people to death, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. You, you can't marry the church and flirt with the world. Right. You can't be holding your wife's hand, walking down the street, checking out every other woman that walks by. That's right. You can't do that. You can't come into church and shout. And yet in your mind, be thinking about this, be thinking about that. All right. Don't get mad at me. This is what James is saying. That's this is right. mature Christianity. The only folks who would have a problem with this are the ones still sucking the bottle. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Take this whole world. Now look at this, verse number seven. And I'll hurry. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yeah. Now, if there's a if there's a verse in Pentecost that's been misquoted, it's James chapter four verse seven, because we always just quote it like this: "Resist the devil, and he'll flee." It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you got to submit to God. Right. And your submission to God gives you the authority to resist the devil. Right. There is no resistance without submission. Right. Amen. Without submission. 
There will never be resistance. You can't resist one power if you've not submitted to another power. That's right. The term submit means to subject oneself to, to obey, to yield to one's authority. The term resist means to stand against, to oppose, to resist. You cannot stand against anything, oppose anything, or resist anything unless you're under the control or obedience of something else. Right. Amen. Now, now this is real simple. But this is what I learned when I came into the church when I was an 11 year old kid. I had a Sunday school teacher tell me this and it stuck with me all these years. You live for God hard and it's easy. Amen. You live for God easy and it's hard. Amen. Yes, sir. Come on. You just try to do it casually and when it's comfortable, you're going to be of all men most miserable. Yes. But if you just make up your mind, I'm going to live for God with everything I've got. I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to submit to the Word of God. I'm going to submit to the man of God. It's going to become the greatest life that you can ever live. Amen. 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 Somebody shout amen. amen. So the question is, stand, I'll close with this. The question is, I know Brother Carmody's got some folks we need to baptize, so I want to be mindful. So the question is, how do I submit to God? I, mean, I know how to resist the devil. Resist the devil becomes natural when you're submitted to God. Right. Now when you're not submitted to God, the devil's going to jump on you and the devil's going to say, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but, but no. Amen. Amen. And you're about to have your clothes ripped off and you're going to look foolish running down the street naked. Because you're trying to fight devils that you're not first submitted to God. Amen. Right. And so if you keep resisting the devil and he does not leave you, understand this. Somewhere there's a submission problem. So how do I submit to God? How do I do this? The answer is simple. It's, it's just found in the next few verses. Verse number 8. Draw nigh to God. Come on. Draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Right. This, is how, this is how you submit yourself to God. Speak not evil of one another. Right. 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 He that speaketh evil of his brother judges his brother. Speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? So how, how do I submit to God? Pastor, I want to submit to God. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Do I need to give more money? Do I need to, do I need to pray a little longer? Do I need, no, here's what you need to do. Draw nigh to God. Yeah. Cleanse your hands. Your hands are your external. Yes. Purify your heart. Internal. Right. You can't have a clean heart and have dirty hands. Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord? Come on. You've got to get your heart right. You've got to get your hands right. Right. If your heart's right, your hand's not going to get dirty. Right, right. If your hands are dirty, clean them and then get your heart right. Right. Amen. Humble yourselves. Yes. Weep and mourn. Speak not evil to one another. How do I draw? That helps you draw nigh to God. That helps you become more like God. I read this today. I'm going to share it with all of you. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He has a book called Nearness is Likeness. He said, the more we are like God, the nearer we are to God. Come on. He said, I may be sitting in my living room with my Siamese cat on my lap, and my wife may be 20 feet away in the kitchen, yet I'm nearer to my wife than to the cat because the cat is unlike me. Yep. That's good. Mm -hmm. Now, he's closer to the cat, but he's nearer to his wife. Amen. When we get near God we're going to become like God Right. draw nigh unto God and God will draw nigh unto you Amen. and then verse 10 says humble yourselves now, now listen I want you to notice those words humble yourselves don't wait on me to do it Right. don't wait on your wife to do it Right. and please don't wait on God to do it you will come out a lot better if you let yourself humble Amen. instead of waiting on God to humble you. Amen. Because God can't humiliate you. Amen. And He would rather humiliate you and get you saved than for you to be happy and unsaved. Amen. 
Amen. But we are instructed to humble ourselves. God, I'm sorry. God, I bring myself. Listen to me. And then he said, this is how you're going to submit to God. Don't speak evil of one another. That's right. right. Here we go talk about that tongue again. God is up to something big in this church. Yes, yes. He is up to something big yes, in this city. Yes, I don't want my mouth to stop it. Right. Amen. And I don't want my pride to stop it. Amen. And I don't want my dirty hands to stop it. Come on. I think we all ought to lift our hands right now and just ask God to help us draw nigh unto Him. Can we do that? Just lift your voice up. God, I want to submit myself to You so I can resist the devil. So I can overcome that temptation. So I can live above that problem. God, I want to I wanna totally draw nigh unto you. I want to I wanna get so close to you that I'm like you. That I like what you like and I hate what you hate. Yes, that God, that people will see you through me. I want to clean my hands tonight. Oh God, I want you, Lord, to let, help me purify my heart. I want to humble myself in your presence. God, I do not want to speak evil of my brothers or sisters. God, I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. I want you to be able to use me. And if that's your prayer, I want you to just shout in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Can you just lift up your voice to the Lord right now? Raise your hands and thank God for His Word. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, we love you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do what God has called us to do. Amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. If Amen. you can go, you can go, Brother Carmody. I'll uh, let you get, get your folks ready, and we're going to rejoice with you as you baptize these people. Amen. Fellowship one with another right now in Jesus' name.